Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded by me, Liam Miller. He, he is a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Love, Rinse, Repeat is recorded on the unceded sovereign lands of the Gayomago people. And my guest today is Gillian Townsley. Gillian, welcome along. Thanks. It's so cool to be here, actually. It's really exciting to have you on. So uh, for folks who don't know, Gillian is a secondary school teacher and chaplain and a teaching fellow at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Townsley has contributed essays to Bible Trouble, Queer Reading at the Boundaries of Biblical Scholarship, Pieces of Ease and Grace, and Sexuality, Ideology, and the Bible. And we are discussing today her book, which is out with SBL Press, uh, The Straight Mind in Corinth, Queer Readings Across 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, which has a wonderful uh, cover, not only the purple, which is uh, scrumptious, but 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 this, uh, you know, the, the art as well. So... So let's, let's start with the book. Uh, you kind of write in the in the introduction, in the acknowledgements, you, you, you acknowledge how long this process was to, to write this book. So I guess talk to us a bit about where the where the idea came from, how the book developed, and uh, and I guess what you were hoping to do with it. Yeah, well, it actually is a long project. If I look back, um, it kind of actually began in my teens when I started going to church and became a Christian and things and started reading the Bible. And I had got, um, you know, enamored with this Jesus who was the savior of the world. And, you know, we were all on the same plane there. But then I started reading Paul yeah. and I was like, hey, what's going on here? And in fact, I've got a Bible here that I had in my teens and you probably won't be able to see it because it is really faded now. But on the 4th of the 6th of 1985, I've got a um, question mark in the margin <laughs> of this passage in oh, Corinthians. Wow. And I'm like, I don't get this. I don't mm. understand this. Why is there somehow now this hierarchy of God, Christ, man, woman, stuff mm. like in verse three? So I had that question there. And then, you know, fast forward 10 years and I'm in my 20s and I was doing my master's. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to do it on that passage because I want to solve this passage. I want to <laughs> figure it out. I want to kind of make it clear what it is and that yeah. classic kind of historical critical kind of a thing and so from there by then I was kind of into kind of feminist biblical studies and I thought yep I'm going to do a feminist thing on this passage and kind of suss it Mm. out but then as I started looking into the passage more clear clear, I guess more clearly Mm. I was like hey hang on there's men in this passage what's going on with the men and why is no Mm. one talking about that or if they are talking about it saying that they were homosexuals back in the day and it was a bad thing um so I started looking at the men I thought mm. now nah, let's flip the gaze back onto the men so then I saw so still doing kind of gender stuff but I was looking mm. at the men and masculinity first century masculinity stuff like that and then later another 10 years ahead when I started doing my PhD down here at Otago in Dunedin I thought I'm still going to tackle this passage but I'm beyond trying to kind of let's sort it out because clearly we can't and I started looking more at the way in which people have used this passage and I moved beyond kind of gender I suppose more into issues of sexuality and understanding that and therefore coming kind of at it from a queer lens or on a queer Mm. angle or something Mm. yeah so I think that's really important because I guess you know, you kind of outline, like, you know, just, just how much ink has been spilt over this passage that Paul probably thought was very clear uh, yeah. and, and sufficient for the time because he was about to come and visit. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'll straighten the rest of it out when I get there. Lots of ink's been spilled. Everyone comes in with their kind of key. This is now how we know how to deal with it. And then, yeah. you know, and we'll trash the rest along the way. Mm-hmm. Um but you go, yeah, let's actually look at what the like the ideology, both kind of, I guess, around and behind the production, but particularly what are the ideological commitments and assumptions in the interpretation, uh, in the way that this is is read and developed. So, so can you talk to us a bit about that, um, like what, what we've, you found those to be, uh, and I guess yeah. then how, how are you going to try to trouble that, I guess? Yeah, it was... It just really occurred to me as I had the time to look at all the commentaries and look at all the ink that has been spilled Mm. on this passage. 
just how adamant each scholar was that this is the key to unlock the passage. Mm. You know, if only we realized that this was an issue about um, men covering their heads, you know, their capite velato thing, then we would understand the passage. Or someone else saying, no, 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 that's not it. It's, you know, Greek ecstatic worship by women and their hair out. Or someone goes, no, 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 it's not that. It's, you know, <laughs> you know, like crazy ones. Well, I shouldn't say that really, but the idea that um, the Greek word, you know, peribelon, um, about covering is actually to do with testicles. And it's just kind of like there was just so many diverse um approaches to this passage but they all were doing exactly like you were saying they were trying to kind of unlock it solve this puzzle try and make this obscure difficult passage clear and i'm like yeah what is that about like why are we so insistent on trying to make something clear what is that in terms of our historical critical kind of his, you know the kind of history of that process of interpretation that is insistent on that and then just kind of, I guess, then also realizing that behind some of those interpretations, there's issues to do with sex, gender, sexuality, the classic kind of triad mm -hmm. that biblical scholars didn't seem to really kind of get. And I mean, I know now, like I'm a teacher in a high school and it's, you know, the 21st century and things, but we still have to have staff meetings in terms of on about our students and those in our queer queer groups that we have at school like okay what is biological sex what is gender what is sexuality and orientation those things are different you know so and for biblical scholars particularly I suppose in the 20th century I mean can be forgiven a bit really for not perhaps really understanding the clarity of or the in, in the mm. fluidity in those terms but then putting them back onto the first century mm, mm. and not understanding a first century understanding of those concepts either. Mm. So you've got a real kind of, um, got some real issues there in terms of educating yeah. <laughs> those who are on those issues, at, you know, who are going to study these kind of passages, you know, biblical studies doesn't usually have a, you know, a gender studies paper mm. 101 <laughs> as part of mm. its curriculum you know and yet yeah. wow the kind of faux pas that people have made over time without because they haven't understood mm. those things so you know just because a man's got long hair doesn't mean he's gay mm. you know like there's issues to do with gender or sexuality or whatever that haven't really been clearly understood so I thought no I need to look into this and I found mm. that queer theory and I guess in gender studies that kind of thing really gave me the tools I needed to to, to learn about the stuff myself I mean the luxury of having a long project is you can dive into these things and take your time to really explore them I mean I had to do that I had to mm. do some gender studies stuff I had to really I mean I'd done feminist biblical stuff but I hadn't really done you know gender studies department at the university stuff and start reading things like Judith Butler and kind of get my head around that yeah. yeah yeah and I guess like you know something else you kind of note with the ideology thing is that you know both Paul in his appeal and and what a lot of the interpreters are doing are, are leading on this idea of um nature and what is natural in yeah. in, in, in in gender relations and, and and in sexuality and that there's a natural unchanging static kind of thing and then and then deviations from that um and that that's this kind of like unassumed or, or, or first priority commitment that then shapes so much of that interpretive work. And again, and, you know, and again, you're pretty trying to say like, well, let's actually acknowledge that and then trouble that. Um, mm. And particularly, I will probably get to this a bit more, like particularize a lot of what we've assumed to be universal and normative. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. So it was um, quite an interesting project in that way and I think because I was doing sort of a, I mean just as an aside really in mm. some ways but because I was doing sort of queer stuff in biblical studies so, you know I was part of the theology department down here mm. which is pretty conservative um 
and in this building and then yeah. there's gender studies way over in that building on the other side of campus and never the twain shall meet kind of yeah. thing <laughs> and and just like that classic kind of queer thing you know I felt like I didn't really belong in either mm. place I've been on the fringes um, myself um, also not being queer myself mm. but kind of you know being a straight ally um, so I mean I had people in the biblical studies or in the theology department going you know what are you doing with that gender stuff I mean they weren't even happy with things being feminist let alone <laughs> queer you know um, and then I had people in the gender studies going, what are you doing with anything to do with the Bible? Like that's, you know, mm. so conservative and what are you doing with that? So it, I mean, I found myself on those crossroads and those kind mm. of cutting across kind of spaces that I was then doing in my work. So mm. yeah, it was, yeah. it was interesting in that way. Mm. So, so a key figure in the book is is Monique uh, Wittig. I'm not sure. If yeah, I'm Wittig, uh, Wittig. Wittig. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of go with Wittig. Wittig. But, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one of those ones you only ever read a word, <laughs> then you're like, oh, oh, now I'm saying it for yeah. posterity on a recording. That's great. Um, yeah. So, so let's just talk, I guess, particularly about how how Wittig's work shapes the project, in particular, I guess, this idea of you know you talked a bit about the the men being ignored or. Or, or just kind of sidelines, so, uh, but the, how this work shapes the project and particularly in bringing the men uh, back into some level of focus. Yeah, so Monique Vidig, she's this, unfortunately died in 2003. I had started this project in 2002 and I'm like, mm. oh, so close to maybe having contact with her. Mm. But um, she was a French feminist, lesbian, materialist, philosopher, political writer novelist mm. and I came across her through Judith Butler's work where Butler kind of really tears her to shreds for her view and a bit of that's that clash between you know kind of American kind of feminist or philosophy and French kind of continental philosophy and feminism are are a bit different anyway but um so I came across her work and I became really intrigued by some of the things she was saying in terms of gender and sexuality like um she was looking at the category of woman and really really pushing it like in night she was writing in the 60s and 70s and 80s and in 1978 she spoke at a modern languages association um gathering in new york mm. and she has this whole talk and then at the end she says lesbians are not women and it created this whole big kind of drama like what what mm -hmm. um and, and so she unpacks what that is and she kind of looks at the concept of woman in this kind of materialist you know kind of marxist kind of way that there's this you know it's an economic political kind of category of um oppression i guess actually mm -hmm. um, but it's all tied up within relation to men so you know she's a wife or a sister or a daughter or whatever like this thing of woman and saying that lesbian is kind of outside of that mm. um kind of those categories and therefore not actually a woman is understood in that kind of I guess a capitalist kind of western mm. um society so you know she got a lot of flack for that but I thought gee that's interesting and I've been reading Stephen Moore's book on and his stuff on Romans and he was talking about taking that which is furthest away from the center the center is your kind of you know real heteronormative patriarchal androcentric you know maybe elite kind mm -hmm. of male figure well then who's at the furthest outside of that camp and bring them into the center so I thought well if if this lesbian figure is way outside there then okay I want to I want to look into this a bit further and and the other thing I liked about um her work is that she's really talks a lot about the power of language mm. um and I mean I've been involved in the 80s and 90s on things like the inclusive language debate and you know that there is power in language and she talked about that and how it has this sort of ability to kind of stamp reality quite violently and I was like yeah you know I think I felt that and people have felt that and people on the margins and fringes feel that mm. um but she was like so let's use it as a tool to then destabilize and to challenge and to um transgress and to um really shake things up and in, 
she has this as you mentioned before she's got this kind of thing where she talks about well let's lesbianize all of these things that are kind of at the center and see what happens mm. um so Moore's kind of idea of bringing the lesbian to the center and Wittig's idea of well, let's lesbianize that which is at the center um, and really put our gaze on it and let's just see what happens to it but play with it in terms of language as well mm. that really appealed to me and I thought well let's have a look at these Corinthian men mm. and let's actually put them under the gaze and do that kind of flip which is sort of more of a feminist thing but let's actually lesbianize these men if we can you know and actually kind of it was kind of a playing thing, mm. but at the same time, you know, there's kind of that seriousness there that, yeah, these are actually figures on the fringes. They're not even looked at by scholarship, or if they are, they're dismissed. So in that way, these Corinthian men are kind of that lesbian figure in that kind of way. I mean, it gets complex because we're not talking about flesh and blood, women mm. who love other women, Kind of lesbian, and this is where Vida got into trouble with, um, other, with feminists or lesbian feminists who are saying, "What you know about us?" But she was more about kind of as a theoretical concept and in language, you know, how do we, how do we do that? So I kind of had fun lesbianizing the Corinthian men and um, just kind of seeing what I could do with that, and mm. yeah, it was fun. Is there anything in particular or even just sharing one kind of thing that like emerges with that gaze, with that, with that flipping? Yeah, I guess, I guess what it did was that instead of, I guess what I wanted to do in some ways was instead of kind of doing that historical critical thing, we mm. go, well, let's have a look what was going on in first century Corinth, these men, you know, um, were they were they gay because they had long hair and was Paul upset about that because as a Roman you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you didn't like that but you know like there's lots of issues there and I thought you know what instead of doing that let's look at these men and actually see maybe maybe they were maybe the men and the women were doing things with gender and, and kind of playing with those things themselves and that kind of ecstatic worship stuff where perhaps they're beyond gender but not just that classic thing where women tra um you know transcend to being mm. spiritual by being masculine mm. and that kind of mm. like with philo kind of has some ideas there and daniel boyer Aaron uses vidic to kind of say that's where things were going with the woman that they were leaving behind the the body and the flesh and becoming spiritual and therefore becoming men i was like well what about the men then? What are they doing? Are they descending that kind of hierarchy and becoming women? That's meant to be a shameful thing. You know, all the Greco-Roman writers who talk about that, you know, don't, whatever you do, don't be like a woman. Um, and, and current, you know, 20th century sort of conservative evangelical things, or even in a, particularly in the United States, you know, if you have long hair, even now today, you know, that's somehow mm. being masculine. Mm. Um so I was like, well, okay, that's meant to be a shameful thing, but maybe instead of that, maybe they didn't see that, maybe they were challenging yeah. that hierarchy that maybe even Paul has in verse three there and actually kind of, they weren't feeling like they were denigrating themselves by being like women, but were somehow embracing that shamelessness. And, yeah. you know, so there's that kind of, almost like having that pride, like, you know, a pride, kind of a thing like you think you know you think you're um you know we we should be ashamed of who we are but we're going to have pride in who we are so we're <laughs> going to take that term queer and and call it our own you know there's all of that kind of yeah. dynamic that goes on with language and how you mm -hmm. position yourself and I was like well let me just reposition these Corinthian men a wee bit and mm. do that so so we've talked about how like you know this is a book that goes across and you know, you're looking at the ideology today as well which brings you into some interesting dialogue partners you know you, you know an extended time exploring the uh the center for biblical manhood and womanhood i think it was called the council uh, council, council sorry yes that. uh and then the the kind of flip side of the um uh, council for biblical uh, yeah, well, they are Christians for Christians for biblical equality. equality or something. Yeah. I think. yeah. Um, and you know, and along the way, you're looking at you know devotional Bibles for God, uh, for 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 whatever you know 
strong men and godly women, yeah. uh, manly men and godly women, and like, you know, and teen Bibles and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I guess you know, talked to us about like, you know, diving into that. Cause I think it's particularly, you know, a fruitful path. Cause I think what, what you're kind of showing is that even though the, you know, those two groups sent uh, council for biblical manhood and womanhood and Christians for biblical equality, are, are kind of in some ways positioned as, you know, diametrically opposed, um, you know, you're kind of demonstrating that there's a particular ideology running or, or at least encasing both. There's particular yeah. commitments that even as they are arguing over a particular point in, in relation to this passage, they're leaving a lot um, still assumed. Oh, yeah, that was, you know, interesting. I found when, you know, you look at, say, verse three, and it's got that concept of kephale, the head, mm. man is the head of woman and all of this stuff in it, and how that's been debated over absolutely furiously by, mm. well, you know, mm. Wayne Grudem looking at, you know, his <laughs> articles, like the 2,463 instances of kephale, and, you know, and then someone else responds to that, and you get, you know, is it headship as an authority mm -hmm. over well even that word headship because it's not even in there in the greek but that's what kind of gets um mm -hmm. talked about this headship stuff uh is huge in those kind of conservative um mm -hmm. organizations or is it about source and origin and therefore somehow is more of a um, egalitarian kind of a view you know you get this over here the the conservative one about headship it's very hierarchical but trying to be positive by saying it's about complementarity, you know, that somehow there's kind of something nice about this hierarchy because it's sort of complementary and we should all just enjoy it and celebrate that. Um, and there's this other group were like, no, actually, you know, that's not great, but there is an equality, a genuine equality yeah. in Christ and in God and between men and women. And yet, as you say, when I was looking into them, I was like, actually, they're all both, even though there's meant to be this big divide between mm -hmm. these groups and these kind of evangelical groups, yeah. they are all very much about the heterosexual couple, um, heteronormative ideology there. Um, and the conservatives might be more patriarchal in that and be more about headship and a hierarchy, but the evangelicals are definitely still it's men and women. You know, there's no mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, yes, the woman might go to work, but there's still a kind of a, um, yeah, this hetero kind of normative couple at the center. So I found that very interesting. And it's like, what's going on in this particularly, I think, I mean, I just focused on kind of like evangelical Western, maybe particularly United States, maybe not, I didn't, well, I looked a little bit at New Zealand, like we've got the Brian Temeki destiny mm. church thing here and when the marriage equality mm. bill was going through um they did a big march on parliament i'm not sure like how far across the world this kind of news goes but it was a little while mm. ago now but you know they they marched on parliament all of these men in black t-shirts you know with their arms in the mm. air looking a lot a bit like something from the you know, World War II kind of mm. era, um, and all about, you know, basically a whole lot of men, the classic kind of men thing, arguing against a marriage equality. Mm. And I just found that whole kind of, what is it going on? What is, what is so threatening about things that are not heteronormative? What is it about that kind of center, again, that patriarchal, um heteronormative man at the center that feels so threatened by things that got nothing to do with them whether or not the couple down the road are going to get married why is that threatening to to him so it was kind of like you know then also looking a little bit i guess with a bit of vitex marxist thing you know what is it about capitalist western society mm -hmm. that needs this nuclear family at its center i mean the, obviously the word capitalist you know, it's kaput, Latin for head. It's like, yeah, there's something in this about that we kind of, that ideology that's there that just doesn't really get examined. If you're in the fishbowl of Western capitalist, you know, heteronormative patriarchal sort of society, you probably don't even see it, but it's, it's a pretty central part of that whole Western 
capitalist ideology, I think, which needed to be. Yeah. 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 And as you say, if that's if that's the unassumed starting point, that's always going to um, set any interpretation of the passage on a particular trajectory. Right? Like, you know, it's already setting these are the there are some different roads you can take, but there's only so many because we've started with a particular, um, you know, a subdiv map. Kind of thing. yes exactly mm. and I mean you know Paul says that he's got God Christ man woman you know like he's kind of got the binary thing there which you know is the whole kind of Greco-Roman thing too mm. but mm. you know so I mean you can look at I mean and plenty of scholars have looked at Paul the man yeah in his Greco-Roman context and you know yeah so another you know mentioned that you know God Christ man woman another uh interlocutor who who, who grabs onto that is is Karl Barth um, who, who you talk about um, in the book as well and you know people off debate that like that section of the dogmatics of you know has Bart do he kind of write himself into a corner and then like you know just commit to something because you know you got other presuppositions but again it's, it's, it's kind of I guess you, as you said demonstrating that you know this particular idea of an appeal to creation mm-hmm. and an appeal to nature mm-hmm. and then then like as Paul kind of is engaging does then shape what what we're doing here and how this passage is is interpreted um yeah. you know so i can only imagine if you're already like you know we're, we're having to like you know um duck around corners in the theology department you know um have, putting a section in on bart might have you know <laughs> you know raise oh, yeah. the spotlight raise the heat a little bit so yeah um yeah, i was a bit naughty i was a bit naughty doing that i did that because i mean there was i mean we had where we do where our postgrad kind of offices where we you know there are theology people and biblical studies people and and others but <laughs> here we go we oh, can we can i yep. deal with them and then we... so i was a bit naughty because in this in this department mm. where there were people doing phds in theology and oh i don't know what it was but they were all big fans of Karl Barth. Mm. And it was like, Bart could do no wrong. And he was like the God, you know. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to see what I can do with Bart and kind of yeah, destabilize yeah, yeah. a bit of that mythology mm. as well. So I thought I would have a bit of fun with him. Well, I mean, I found it quite distressing really because they were all taking everything he said so seriously. And, mm. and like you say, this kind of section on the, in the dogmatics on his stuff on men and women and we <laughs> talking about homosexuality and mm. things he really has kind of reverted right back to you know grounding everything in this kind of nature and what's natural what's mm. normal kind of language and you just have to be so suspicious I think mm. of that kind of language because it really does um you know seem to therefore be unquestionable so you mm. need to question it yeah um, which is kind of what I had fun doing yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um it might be fun to talk a bit about form uh, in the hmm. book, um, and because I, I can see over your shoulder a Wonder Woman comic, uh, Ooh, and there is a, uh, a a a a scene in the book. You have this kind of like a motif of a few scenes that come out. One one in which you you talk to uh, a a escaped Wonder Woman off the co- off cover of a comic book. So so yeah. talk to us a bit about this. And we'll come to another area where you use form kind of interestingly in, in the last chapter soon. But um, yeah. yeah, these these scenes and this playing with form yeah. in general and, and, and what you're hoping, what you were hoping to, you know, yeah, get at with that. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I really, I decided that part of the kind of queer thing in some ways is, you know, it's not just an academic, theoretical, you know, ivory tower sort of stuff. It's actually about real people's lives and the ways in which these concepts have oppressed people and so but also in that like you're doing a PhD and it's like you know you can kind of get into that whole academic Mm. kind of or or writing a book you know it can be very academic kind of an approach it's like you know what like I need to as as Vidig says you know play around with the language a bit too and kind of be creative and be a little bit imaginative and kind of sensual and all of those things as well so yeah I have these three scenes in the book and I was digging around in my comic collection which I have been told is the biggest Wonder Woman 
comic collection in New Zealand, actually. Oh, wow, there you go. Uh, yeah, my, put that on the promotion for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> like my, my oldest comic that I have is from 19, is number issue number 20 from like 1943 or something. Mm. And I've got a really good smattering of, of them ever since then. But I had been looking at, um, I've got this one here, which is the one I mentioned oh, yes. in the scene where Wonder Woman is, this is in 1960s, yeah, the 1960s, and she's being pulled by these different men, you know, Amoeba Man and <laughs> Merman and Steve Trevor, you know, marry me, marry me, Wonder Woman. I was like, oh, my God, this is so far from, you know, what does that tell you about? Well, it's really interesting. You know, what does that tell you about the 60s? Does that tell you that, I mean, the 60s was all about freedom, right? So maybe with some of these comics were kind of going back to, hey, let's get back to being conservative again. Um, and and then I'd, I had this um, edition of Ms. Magazine, the, mm. the very first issue of Ms. Magazine, and it was like, you know, Wonder Woman for president sort of stuff, mm. which actually echoed a really ancient, a really old Wonder Woman comic from mm -hmm. maybe the 1940s, I think, actually, which I don't have, but it's on my list. Um, but yeah, and, and so I kind of just sort of came up with this, I think I, mean, I wrote that in about an hour, it was just mm. like this sort of thing about Wonder Woman and, and in relation to verse three and the kind of hierarchy and, mm. and also, you know, tapping into stuff like women being silent in church stuff. Yeah. I didn't have her speak, just mm. kind of do other things to kind of say what she mm, wanted to say but mm. without using words and stuff and play around because you know she's an amazon and mm. you know, they what's the gender stuff I think i've got a book on my shelf just down there on the amazons you know what's their um gender mm. stuff and going on there so and then the one with bart you know i had fun mm. with that too just kind of playing around with the sort of power and sex yeah, stuff there yeah. and then my last one on um to do with nature mm -hmm. and in verse 14 and 15 about what is natural and does mm. not nature teach you that x y z when in fact nature teaches you a whole lot of stuff that yes. doesn't always mean that um so i had a photo from it well a friend who's a photographer that i used because uh, yeah when i mm. started talking to him about these things about nature and what is natural or not yeah. um he did a whole lot of photographs and sent me some and so I wanted mm. to use one in there too and just kind of look at that but yeah so I guess there's a as a kind of a concept it's just sort of like to remind the academy that these things are deeply personal and about identity mm. and about sensuality and that things like creativity and ways of viewing the world are uh, not just through that academic lens as well so i wanted to trouble that mm. a little bit yeah i think you know it, it really really are it, it's really great like it, it is stuff that you want to see more places exploring more, that, that explored in more ways and and also i guess you're showing you know the way that you know in ways direct and indirect so much of the culture is shaped even even in a very post christian mm. whatever that means secular whatever that means yeah um kind of context of people writing comics about, yeah. about an amazonian woman is still like swayed by so much of this ideology and so if we're unthinkingly perpetuating it or assuming it then, then you know we probably play into that too so i think that you know without you know having to belabor that point it's done in these kind of playful but but again as you kind of said there's this this play but also this seriousness because it is again about lives and yeah so i think it's really mm. fun and good mm, mm. Oh, um, cool. the other the other aspect of form which is something i don't think i've seen really uh, in a book is in in um pretty much the chapter six yeah. um where you there's there's a battle over page space uh between oh, what's the guy's first name gagnon robert robert, robert gagnon Gagnan. and um and vitik who we've established i'll try to hold it up for those who are seeing but you see at the beginning of the chapter um Gagnon has has the bulk of the page as a line and then it slowly changes as you go along where the line moves up and up and up as Vitek takes more and more of the page space and, and pushes and pushes uh Robert Gagnon off off the page as it were so again mm. I mean I'm kind of interested in a couple of things one you know the development of this idea mm. how it was how you felt going mm. for it and what you were trying mm. to accomplish and also mm. whether it became 
very difficult to, 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 to write, to, to actually construct this, right? To like, you know, how do I do it in a way and where do the changes happen? And, you know, oh, yeah. very different kind of thing to write and whether it just sent you mad and you're like, look, it's good, I'm glad it's there. I will never do it again. Um, yeah. But, but it, you know, it was worth it or, or whether it was actually like, you know, refreshing in its own way again to, to be like kind of pushed at a, a different way of thinking about how you actually use the page mm. use the actual material mm. component of a book absolutely like I first came across that kind of thing again with Stephen Moore in mm. his um book on <laughs> God's beauty God's beauty parlor and he has two columns sort of side by side for some of it and so that got me thinking and then um but it is quite an interesting journey this because I've got my actual uh, 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 thesis here right and what I actually did in that was not what ended up in the book. <laughs> what I did, and I'll see if I can hold this oh, up, yeah. I had them side by side. And I had the Vidic stuff in the margins, right? Mm. Uh -huh, in the margins, down the left-hand side. And sh so, and there's the, and the Gagnon stuff there, dominant mm. on the right. And then as the pages move on, mm. she starts to push him off the page until he's down the margin and then actually pushes him off altogether to the point where, oh my God, there's footnotes, I'm told to where it's basically, yeah, just her. Yes. So that was what I did. I did it as two columns and I mm. liked the idea of her being in the margins mm. on the left and then pushing. Now, oh my God, was that difficult in terms of formatting. <laughs> And in my acknowledgements, I acknowledge a, a friend, Chris Carolus, who was also doing his PhD, who knew more about the technology of how to do that sort of stuff. And he, you know, we spent hours and hours and hours with formatting that. Then it comes to the book and SBL didn't want to do the columns. It was too expensive. And I could see that having done it myself. It was like mm. hours of work. Um, they didn't want to do that. And I was like, no, this is symbolically mm. such an important thing. Gagnon is such a dominant, or was, I'm not sure if he still is, it'd be interesting to know, but such a dominant force. He'd written this massive book called The Bible and Homosexuality, mm. which was literally kind of being used to bash people over the head with. And it was such a dominant voice. And he was always so, I mean, I got an email from him at one point about my work that was pages and pages and pages pages long so he was like mm. big on kind of hitting you with quantity mm. um so i wanted him to be dominant on the page to start with and yeah. Vitek, who you know such a minor person that most people don't even know who she is i wanted her work and her mm. views on things to be on the margin and then literally physically um push him off the page because both of them um Gagnon in particular I don't know if you've ever read it but it's so anatomical it is all about what is nature and natural to the point where he's talking about you know penetration and vaginas are receptacles for penetrating penises and all of this and it's just like oh horrendous but then Vidig is this novel that is called The Lesbian Body and it is so physical and all about bodies and like I've just opened to a random page and it's you know um, you who are featureless without hands breasts belly vulva limbs thoughts you are my body eyes you know like it's it's very very mm. physical as well and I thought yeah you know this this kind of what is natural stuff okay let's really get into it mm. um, but when they they wouldn't do it for the book and I to be honest, I got to the point where I was like, oh, well, I could swear here, but, you know, stuff that. I don't need a book. This is so important to me that I would ditch the whole project if I can't have something symbolic. What they wanted was the material on Gagnon to be first and then follow pages later by all the Vidig stuff, which just is not the whole point. Yeah. So they came up with this idea of we'll have Gagnon stuff on the top of the page and we'll have the Vidig stuff at the mm. bottom. And then I've got very good friends who are scholars, Roland Bohr, Australian scholar, amazing, and um, Christina Peterson, um, who's Danish, but also Australian. And I was talking to them about like, oh, what do I do? And they were like, 
you know what? There's something very sexual about the he's on the top straight <laughs> man and a lesbian woman underneath that he's trying to dominate and squash down mm. and maybe because it's a physical penetrate. And I was like, ooh, and she's going to actually literally physically push him off her and push him off the bed, get rid of him mm. and stand herself. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'll go with that then. And that's what they did. I, the line is a bit clunky aesthetically, but symbolically and what it's kind of saying, I think, is part of that queer project too, that it, again, it's not just, mm. you know, academic theory ideas, but it's real gritty bodily um, mm. Lives, people's lives and identities that are at stake here, literally at stake in terms yeah. of um, stuff. So, yeah, I wanted to do that. It was fun. Yeah. That's great. Well, Gillian, thank you so much for for joining us today and talking about the wonderful book and and and, and in such detail and depth. And so, folks, do check out the Straight Mind in Corinth queer readings across 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16 uh, with the SBL Press. Uh, pick it up where you can. Uh, talk to your library if they don't have it, get, get it in. Um, Gillian, is there anything else you want to promote, draw people's attention to, anything like that at all? Um, no, not really. I just think that, I mean, for me personally, you know, having then shifted out of the academy and gone mm. high school teaching, um, I'm going to still dabble a little bit and I'll be teaching Greek yeah, next year and things like that. But um, just being in kind of, yeah, the high school context with students who are grappling with issues of gender and sexuality mm. Um, mm. and bullying and the things that go on still today. It's like, yeah, this, this is, this is really important, mm. really important stuff that we can kind of deconstruct that very heteronormative kind of ideology and actually for the sake of the lives of people who are grappling with their own identities and where they belong and, and, mm. and all of that. I think it's, it's important stuff. So thanks for oh. asking about this and, and really, yeah, getting, giving me a chance to talk about the book. Uh, I'm more than happy to. I'm really glad you, you came on and uh, yeah, have a happy school holidays and folks. Uh, thanks for watching and we're listening and we'll see you next week. Yay. Bye.